Hello friends, my name is Hannah and welcome to a wrap up of everything that I read in August. Now, two disclaimers for today. Um, other than, I hope you're enjoying my very best pebbles impression. Um, it is the second day of the new academic year, which means I am tired as I record this. So, um, if at any point I sound like I've lost the plot, genuinely just go with it. It's part of the brand. And um, secondly, if you fancy a drink, um, now might be a good time to like pour yourself one because I have invented a drinking game, which is every time I say a video, which I will link in the channel down in the box down below, take a drink. It's gonna happen a lot in this video. I'm sorry about it. Um, I am asking you with a humble heart to please find it endearing and not annoying. Um, but a lot of these books, almost all of these books that I'm talking to you about today, I have talked about in more detail in a video that is either already up on my channel or will be coming up in the future. So let's go. I read 17 books in August, which is, I think, the most I've read all year. And yet I, I don't really feel like I had a very good reading month in terms of getting through my actual TBR. I had some rereads and I also had a lot of books that I have borrowed, which is lovely and great and a brilliant thing to do. Um, but my physical TBR is untouched. <laughs> nothing has changed. So hey ho, the first two books I'm going to talk to you about are included in two videos on my channel. Um, a while ago I filmed a reading vlog where I was reading seven titles that my best friend had picked for me off of my physical TBR and two of those books, most of them I read in July but two of them I finished in August so they were really good actually by Monica Hasey and His Bloody Project by Graham McRae Burnett. Um, so the first one, really good actually. Oh, apologies. Um, I just don't have the energy right now to go and pull all of the physical copies. And also I don't have the physical copies of a number of the books that I'm talking about. So we're just inserting this month. Sorry. Um, it does mean that I get to go full handsy though. So that's nice. Um, really Good Actually by Monica Hasey is a funny, witty book about a young divorcee in Canada. Um, she is a, I th she's sort of like a bit of a millennial Bridget Jones character. I sort of liked this book, but I didn't love it. It was um, one of the ones, in fact, I'm not going to tell you compared to the other titles because as well as the reading vlog, there is also an ep uh, a video linked down below where Farmer and I have a kind of chit chat about all seven of the titles and we guess each other's ranking of the seven titles. Um, so I'm not gonna tell you where I ranked it in the seven that I read because spoilers. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's not too much of a spoiler to be like, I didn't love it. Um, it was very funny. Um, at parts, I I laughed out loud, but for me, the there was a bit too much comedy and a bit too much um, played for like quips and laughs rather than um, I don't know. I guess sometimes the comedy felt like it got in the way of me really emotionally investing in the character. But I think it is a perfect holiday read. So if you are going to get some winter sun anywhere, I recommend. I recommend it. It's it's. It's a good time if you want something that's just not too taxing. It's just gonna take you on a fun little ride um, with a very messy woman. She reminded me quite a lot of like Hannah in, is, it, is she called Hannah in Girls? Lena Dunham's character in Girls. I think she's called Hannah because I think there's a reason I didn't like her is because she's got my name. Um, yeah, she reminded me like a little bit of her, but like a little bit older. Fine, it was fine. 
Um, and the other book I, I did uh, really enjoy, it was His Bloody Project by Graham McRae Burnett, as I said. And this is an interesting book. This is, um, it is a novel, but it sort of um, presents itself as if it's a series of found non-fiction um, documents. Um, at the start, there's this preface written by the author basically saying, oh, I was researching my family tree. Um, and I found this um, episode in my in my family's history and it's a triple murder in the Scottish Highlands in like the 1860s. Um, so it's presented as like there's some like news articles or like found material. There's the journals of the murderer who is an ancestor of um, of the author, an ancestor of the author. He's not um, but yeah, it was really, it was really interesting. I think um, it's not like, I said this when I was talking, either in the vlog or when I was talking to Farmer, but it does a very good job of being the sort of writing that it is pretending to be, i.e. The journals are very convincing journals and the kind of articles and statements are very convincing but obviously some of those things are quite dry. On the whole I found it a really captivating read but it's it's not a very long book and I think it is well judged because I think uh yeah if you're after sort of um very elevated flowery prose it's it's maybe not the one not the one for you at parts it can feel quite um utilitarian um i guess but i i really enjoyed it i thought it was really um inventive it's one of the ones that i think i'd picked it up second hand at like um maybe barter books in anik and um i picked it up because i recognized it as being a kind of book a backlist book um so that was the reason that I'd I'd picked it up and and it's definitely it's definitely a very interesting read. So from triple murder to something completely different. Um I had a I had a heart stopper moment in August as I think many many people did. So uh season 2 of um the YA series Heart Stopper came on to Netflix and um I reread the four volumes um, of the graphic novel by Alice Oseman. Here they are, uh, which I had read before. They're lovely. They're charming. Um, if you're, who isn't familiar with Heartstopper these days? But if you're not, it's a very sweet sort of YA romance um, between two boys at a school, and it's got a lovely, diverse cast of characters um and I recommend them they're lovely I do not like YA and I like these um so there you go uh but in addition to those four volumes that were as I said rereads for me I also read um the two kind of companion novellas so there's actually I think there's seven um books currently in the kind of Heartstopper universe um there's a novel Solitaire which um comes in the timeline to you but I've already read that I didn't reread that because I didn't actually love Solitaire um but I did read these two novellas which was the first time I'd read them so I read This Winter um which I thought it was fine um it takes place on one Christmas day um is it Christmas day yeah it is Christmas day and uh it follows each of the spring children. So Charlie in um, Heartstopper is one of the main characters. So it follows him, his older sister and his younger brother and kind of their, their three experiences of one Christmas day. Um, but it did very much feel sort of like, like bonus, like bonus footage. <laughs> Essentially, I, I didn't really feel like it necessarily added much to the overall narrative of Nick and Charlie's relationship and and stuff like that. It was kind of some useful colouring in, I guess, but um, I didn't love it, but I did really like Nick and Charlie, um, which is sort of dealing more with um, 
because Nick is a, a school year above Charlie and he's going away to university and it's got kind of that like angsty bit and it all felt a little bit more grown up than the version of their relationship that we see in the graphic novels um, and I just I am like an unapologetic Nick Nelson stan like what that boy has done for bisexual rep um <laughs> <laughs> I love him. He can do no wrong in my eyes. So it was uh, it was nice to it was nice to see their relationship and have a little bit more of Nick. Maybe that's what I didn't like about this winter. Not enough Nick. Not enough Nick. Um, but yeah, that was lovely and charming. So that was kind of six. Six of my 17 books were that. And I read all six of those in one evening because the graphic novels take no time at all. And the novellas super, 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 super quick as well. So um yeah, I think if you're looking um, for someone who is like a YA fan and they like Heartstopper and they've not read the novellas, they're like a nice little gift set. Recommend reading this winter around Christmas time. Um, yeah, lovely, charming. And then I read not as many books in this category as I would like. Oh, hang on. I missed a drinking opportunity. Sorry. Um, it wasn't a reading vlog, but I did film a video in and around the release of, of Heartstopper. I watched the series a couple of times when it first came out because that's what I do. Um, I find something that gives me dopamine and then I keep doing it. So I've now seen that series quite a few times given that it's only been out a month. Um, and yeah, there is a video linked down below. Drink. Um, if you... Uh, if you were interested in my sort of slightly shambolic and not at all ordered opinions on the series, the t specifically the TV series of Heartstopper. I do do a little bit of comparing it to the books, but like I did not plan like an in-depth comparison sort of situation. So scattered musings about Heartstopper, links down below. And yeah, the next two books I read, I read for WIT. So August, as you may know, is Women in Translation Month. And I only read two, two translated titles this month, which is um, not as many as I would have liked. And also they were both from the same country. And then I realized also had the same translator. So I read two Korean books, um, both of which were translated by Jamie Chang. Um, the first one I read is Concerning My Daughter by Kim He Jin and this is a book that I was really glad to get to because I actually bought it last year to read in Women in Translation Month and didn't get to it and it's I did that annoying thing that we do sometimes where in my head that's a wit book and therefore I can only read it in August um, and so when I didn't get to it last August I probably left it on my shelf and didn't touch it again um, but it was the August pick for the book club that I'm part of, um, Queer Books Newcastle. So I, it was nice to kind of finally have a specific reason to read that book. And it's, it's not necessarily, it's a, it's a difficult little book in a way. Um, it's quite a challenging read. So it is um, a piece of LGBTQIA fiction. But it's told from the perspective of a mother who her adult daughter has, um, for various reasons, needed to move back home. And um, she has brought with her her girlfriend. And the mother really, really struggles to accept her daughter as a queer woman. And because the book is told from her perspective, that can be quite difficult to read. It was also though why I'm really glad that I did read it because I have definitely not read many books written from that perspective. Um, and it was interestingly explored. I don't necessarily think there was as much of a journey as I would have liked to see in terms of her understanding but I also think unfortunately that's probably quite realistic and quite true to life but it was a really interesting book about social expectations of women in Korea as well as what it means to be a family and what it means to find love and have a partner and because one, one of the things that the mum can't wrap her head around is 
that her in her in her mind her daughter will never have a family if she's queer because she can't she can't she can't have children you know a woman can't get her pregnant a woman can't give her a baby um now we obviously know that there are families come in all shapes and sizes and there are many many ways to be a parent um and to have children but the mum doesn't understand that um and i think that was it was a explored in a really interesting way. I did find sometimes that the writing was a bit heavy or like it was like moving through treacle sometimes uh, to, to get through it. Now whether that was me bringing my own perspectives into it and making me quite resistant to to the central characters perspective I I don't know possibly um but I am I am really glad that that I read it and I do I do recommend it if you're if you're interested in reading sort of um getting a kind of broader perspective I guess on how queer identities are understood in different um parts of the world um then I do recommend that and then the second book I read I listened to on audiobook and it was Kim Ji Young born 1982 by Cho Nam Ju, and this again was translated by Jamie Chang and it was read by Jamie Parker of History Boys fame. Um, and I really, I really enjoyed this. It was an unusual book, I think. So Kim Ji Young is the um, most common like female name in South Korea. Uh, and so, what the author is doing is essentially she's she's written this sort of every woman character and and what the book is is it's only short the audiobook i think was under four hours um and essentially she tells this this the life story of an average korean woman and it was it was really interesting actually um i know i was said i was a bit disappointed to have only read books from the same country this month but it was actually interesting to kind of read this in conversation with Concerning My Daughter because in lots of ways they are this was also very very bound up in societal expectations of women in Korea um very much about um trying to get out of the gender stereotypes of what a man's role is and what a woman's role is um, and the book does sort of blur this sort of fake autobiography with almost at parts it felt more like non-fiction um, and she does include things like you know the gender pay gap statistics in, in Korea and, and statistics about um, women returning to work after having children and the challenge of being of, of women's labor being valued less in society and actually I hadn't realized um and I'm going to get this statistic wrong because I'm terrible at remembering details but it was something like um South Korea having the biggest gender pay gap of any country in the OECD um and so it was it was definitely the book definitely felt like political outcry as novel um but i think if you are if you are interested in um sort of intersectional feminism and understanding feminism um in the context of different cultures i think it's a great book to read i love that they it, it felt quite apt at first i was really confused about why they chose jamie parker a white man to narrate this story of this one woman's life but actually I think it was a a brilliant nod to some of the sort of more satirical um and ironic parts of the book um because like of course the best person to narrate a woman's life is a man of course <laughs> But yeah, he did a very good job. He did a very good job. Um, but yeah, um, and again, it, it, much like concerning concerning my daughter, it, it also was a lot about motherhood and um, the compromises sometimes that women have to make um, in order to become mothers, uh, and the fact that 
uh, it is often sort of more transformative for women, for the, the woman's life, if we're talking heteronormative relationships, the woman's um, life is more transformed by having children than the man's. Um, and and uh, it was, yeah, it was just, it was, it was very interesting. It was very interesting. And um, I do recommend it. As I said, it's only a, it's only a short little one. So then, um, in a second, I'm going to talk to you about the Booker Prize long list. Um, so I decided this year that I was going to try and read the entire Booker Prize long list. I'm halfway through that at the moment. Um, and I am vlogging the experience of that, but I don't have a video yet for you to link down below because I haven't finished reading the books. But the Booker Prize long list this year is pretty heavy. Um, you will see in a second what I mean. Um, and I was feeling in the need of some light relief. And um, so I decided to read A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J Maas. Now, I have never read any Sarah J Maas before. I am not a big fantasy reader. Um, some of you will know that I am kind of slowly traipsing my way through the Wheel of Time series, but that other than The Lord of the Rings, that's the only sort of like high fantasy sort of series I've read in terms of like big series. I did start the Game of Thrones series, but I think I fell out of them around book three. But yeah, I'm not a big one into fantasy. And um, you will also know if you've been here a time that um, romance is not my bag. Not, not my bag at all, in fact. Um, and yet, I don't know. There's something about, I got influenced. I picked this book up knowing full well I'm not its target audience I was never going to be the person who was going to absolutely love it but a while ago I fell into um a YouTube black hole as happens to all of us occasionally uh and I I found Carrie Can Read who is wonderful and you will probably have heard from her if you're a regular on the old booktube uh she's brilliant and what she does especially well are plot summaries of very famous fantasy books, um, particularly fantasy romances. And I ended up watching her entire series where she does Akatar, A Court of Thorn and Roses and the subsequent books. Um, and I was intrigued, man. I was intrigued by this book. Um, can't tell you why, but I read it. And what started as a reading vlog very quickly devolved into me giving you a kind of live play-by-play -play of the entire plot of A Court of Thorns and Roses. Um, it was so long that I had to split it into two videos because my laptop threatened to set on fire. Um, and um, if you want, they're linked down below. Um, what do we say about this book? This is, this is, it is a high fantasy romance book. It is a little bit smutty. I think it gets a heck of a lot smuttier in future books. And here's the thing. It's not a good book. Sorry, it's not a good book. But filming that video, I think, was the most fun I have had on any of the video projects that I've worked on on my channel so far. Sometimes I just really enjoy being a bit of a cynical, snarky bitch. And um, I wish that wasn't my personality, but it is. Um, and so I had a lot of a lot of fun reading this book. It is dramatic and ridiculous, but there is something compulsive in in the world that Sarah J Maas has created and I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry and I will be reading the rest of the series. So there's that um, brief interlude before we get into the serious business of the Booker Prize long list. So I made a promise to myself this year, which so far I have been able to keep, um, which was that Book prizes are often my kryptonite in terms of, um, I'm trying to be much more mindful 
about how I buy books, what books I buy, when I buy them and why I buy them. Um, because I tended to buy a lot by whim, things would languish on my shelves for ages, um, and then I would turn around and be like, why did I even buy this book? I don't... Um, I have, I have an issue with impulse control, okay? And a previous Hannah may have seen the Booker Prize long list and thought, I'm gonna buy them. Not this year. This year, I decided to see if I could get, source the entire long list without paying anything or without paying anything extra. And so far, I have managed to do that through a mixture of physical loans from two libraries that I'm a member of. I'm a, I live in the Northeast. I'm a member of both Newcastle City Libraries and North Tyneside Libraries. Um, also through BorrowBox, which is what my libraries use up here. Other people, I think, use Libby for um, learning audio and ebooks from your library. And two of the titles I also found on Scribd, which I already have a subscription for. So while I wasn't technically getting them for free, I wasn't paying any extra for them. So that's, that's the preface and that I'm just quite chuffed about that. And it's the main reason that I don't have a big stack of books to show you, um, because they're back in the library because what a shock horror everyone wants to read the book of Rise long list so that's good I, it makes me happy that people are using their libraries though so here we go the first one i read was western lane by chetna maru this is a really um sort of really interesting portrait of um a family in grief so it follows a um a family in London? This was the first one I read, so it's been a while. Um, I'm pretty sure it's like West London way. Um, and they have recently, the mother has died recently and the family are sort of trying to work out, I guess, how to fill this gap that the mother has left in their life. And the dad is sort of, floundering quite a bit and decides that what the three girls it's three three daughters what they're going to do to sort of deal with this to sort of uh, get through this difficult period is get really 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 into playing squash um and so that's what the kind of book is about it's about this particularly the the youngest daughter um discovering this sport in the wake of her mum's death but it is it's a very sort of quiet understated book and I think it did a really good job of capturing a specific period of grieving which I don't think is often explored when we think about grief because it, it's not this sort of immediate aftermath of the death we don't see the mum die she hasn't just died um but it's relatively soon after the fact um and it's not dealing with the long-term legacy of the grief it follows this quite it's qu quite a condensed period of time like a few months um and I, I liked it um it didn't blow me away um if I'd read it prior to the long list would I have expected it to be on the Booker Prize long list? Possibly not, but I don't really have many complaints about it. Um, it was it was sweet, it was good, I, I liked it. Um, I do have a vlog coming out uh, with all of these, as I said, but um, not yet, because 13 is a lot of books and some of them are real long. Um, speaking of, the next one I read was really long, uh, which was In Ascension by Martin McInnes. And I listened to this on audio on Scribd. This was one of the titles that was on Scribd. Um, and it is narrated by Freya Miller. This is like, su it's almost like the complete opposite of Western Lane um, in terms of scope and scale. Um, this is, this this book is massive in terms of its reach and it is asking very big questions about who we are and where we're coming from and it asks those both on a personal level and on a sort of species level 
Um, it follows a woman called Lee who is a microbiologist? Sure. You don't come here for detail, right? Let's call her a microbiologist. Um, and she's looking, her kind of field of study is algae. And um, it's because it was one of the sort of first life forms, first complex life forms um, on, on the planet, you can ask a lot of philosophical questions through, through this, this study of algae and her research takes her to the frontiers of human knowledge and human experience. I, I came into this book knowing absolutely nothing about it and I'm, if I sound like I'm being vague as fuck it's because I, I think the best way to go into it is not knowing where the book ends up because that's part of the the magic of it um and I did I I thought this book was so impressive in terms of the what it was intellectually grappling with um and it was also a lot about this idea of trying to sort of make sense of our ourselves Lee as she's kind of going through all of these um experiences is also reflecting on her childhood and trying to understand and grapple with her own early life experiences and realizing that maybe that things weren't exactly as she remembered them and is trying to almost construct for her herself this um origin story or she has already constructed an origin story and now she's slightly picking it apart and wondering if maybe that is exactly what happened it's very very clever I don't think it was a faultless book but I really um I really respect and admire the ambition of it and I think Martin McInnes is a really great writer it it's like literary science fiction in when I when I talk about it in in the vlog in in more detail I I can Im I can imagine Christopher Nolan directing an adaptation of this book. So if you like the films of Christopher Nolan, I think you will like this book. Um, so there, there we go, that was number two. And then the third book I read on the long list was A Spell of Good Things by Ayabami Adebayo. And I liked this book. It's the first of hers I've read. I know, um, her debut novel got a lot of love and people really liked that. Was that also nominated for the Booker? It was definitely nominated for the Women's Prize. Um, and I, I liked this. It's sort of, um, it's set in modern day Nigeria and it follows two families whose lives end up intersecting, but who are kind of on, in very different places on the class hierarchy in Nigeria. Um, we follow one family who are really, really struggling to make ends meet and are having to make really difficult decisions about which of their children gets to go to school and access education and which of them do they have to pull out because they can't afford to send both of them to school. And then we also follow a young junior doctor who's from quite a well-networked, well-to-do family in Nigeria. And we sort of the book is like watching this really slow collision happening. Um, I did think it took a while to get going. Um, I think uh, the author was really laying the groundwork before the it felt like the plot kicked in. Um, I liked it, it made me cry, but it hasn't, I don't know, I, I, didn't, I didn't love it. It was like, I read it and was like, yeah, that's a good book. And I, I, yeah, it is a good book. It's a very good book. I, I, I just, um, I haven't really thought about it much since um, I read it, which surprised me because at the time I found it more emotionally affecting, but that has, it has waned a little bit um, since I, since I read it. Um, the fourth book I read, I also listened to on Scribd. This was Pearl by Sean Hughes, and it was read by Laura Bryden. This is another book featuring a missing slash absent mother. There are so many books on this long list that are dealing with legacy trauma, death of a parent or missing parent, like 
this is what I meant by that. like none of these books are the most horrifying thing I've ever read but reading them all close together has bummed me out <laughs> massively but that's not Pearl's fault it's not Pearl's fault that I read it in and amongst a load of other books that were kind of thematically similar but this is um the story of a girl whose mother disappeared when she was younger she just sort of disappeared um and nobody was ever recovered um but they assume that she's dead and this has obviously had a really lasting impression on her life and the book is told sort of um from her perspective with hindsight so as she's telling you about her childhood we know that she is now um, an adult woman who has her own child um and it's a really really it was a really interesting and nuanced um exploration of of motherhood of trauma and memory and um it had this great sort of relationship with sort of nursery rhymes and folklore i think the book in as a whole is riffing off of a medieval poem of the same name um which i think is sort of attributed to the the same writer as uh Sir Gawain and the Green Knight which I have read but I know nothing about Pearl and haven't read it and I don't feel like not knowing it took away from my experience but I imagine that if you are familiar with that poem it might enrich your experience um and I I liked it again this more in the sort of style of Western Lane was more of a quiet introspective book um but I thought um oh did I say that this was read by Laura Bryden because I thought the narration of this was fantastic it's one of the best audiobooks I've listened to in the last few months I thought it was great um and yeah this one this one left me feeling achy not completely bereft but definitely achy there we go okay final two here we go. So the fifth book I read, <laughs> fifth book I read, uh, was This Other Eden by Paul Harding. Um, and this is a historical, historical fiction book set on, I think, a fictional island off of the northeast coast of the United States. Um, and the people who live on this island are a sort of have very mixed sort of backgrounds. It's almost this sort of uh, little safe haven of refugees have sort of gathered here over time. So there have been um, people who have escaped slavery, uh, originally set up the island, but then we've had migrants come from Ireland and elsewhere. And it's this, it's sort of its own little isolated community. And I love books that look at people who are very very separate from sort of larger society mainstream society um and because of the mixed heritage of the people on the on the island um there's a lot of uh mixed race people there and this i can't remember exactly when this is set but it's like 90 early 20th century early 20th century i think late I'll put it on the screen. I can't fucking remember. Um, but essentially we know from the outset that the white inhabitants of the mainland who sort of have to look at the island um, want the residents to be moved. They, they, they think that their way of life is unacceptable, that they are a blight on the community, even though they're their own community and they're not really involved in that community. And um, But, you know, they're racist and they don't want those people there and they get cleared out. Now this is based on um, what really happened um, in Maine and I'm sure in other parts of the US and I'm sure in other colonized areas. Um, but yeah, it is about that. And I do think it was really interesting because there's this, there's this character, it's, it's a very ensemble story and one of the characters in it um is uh essentially he's white passing um 
he isn't white but and his siblings aren't white and his parents aren't white but he sort of looks just because you know of the way genetics works he he looks like he could be white and there is this sort of um sort of priest guy who is probably hearts kind of in the right place contextually but he basically thinks oh well i can't really do much for these black and brown people but i might actually be able to help this boy because you know if people think he's white he might actually have a chance of being able to do something he's a very gifted artist um and so part of the story follows him being kind of separated from his family and and sent off into the world this he that he he is not at all equipped for um because he he has lived on this island and um, for a very long time and doesn't really know anything about the way the wider world works and the book was asking lots of interesting questions um and I, on a kind of sentence by sentence level i enjoyed the writing i am still kind of conflicted about the way certain characters were centralized in it and the kind of angle that the author took on telling this story but i do think it was very interesting and it was a part of history that i didn't really know much about so again my, like a lot of the books on the book of writers it's not a favorite i didn't love it but i'm glad i read it um so then finally uh the last book i read um is Old God's Time by Sebastian Barry. This is one of the many Irish books on the on the long list this year. Um, and Sebastian Barry, I know, is a very celebrated and well-respected Irish author. I haven't actually read any of his books before. Um, so I was really glad to get to this. And I, I really liked this one. Well, I say I loved it. I really liked it. Um, this follows uh, a man called Tom Kettle, who is a retired policeman and he has just sort of is he's, he's just got to a point in his retirement where he's he's set up in this new place that he's living in he's living in like um this sort of lean to on the side of a castle um out on the out on the irish coast and he's just sort of settling into his retirement he's just sort of going right this is me now i've done the living now i'm going to essentially sit here and quietly I don't know, sort of, what are the things that are attached to like rock faces? That's how I sort of imagine him. He's like, I'm just stuck here on my castle and this is me now, I'm just gonna chill here. And then he gets a knock on the door one night from two policemen who are currently serving saying, we need your help um, because some things have come to light with this historic case that you worked on back in the day. Um, and we wanna to talk to you about it. And essentially what happens then is a lot of things that have been repressed in Tom's past start bubbling up to the surface. And, and it's really, the book is really a, an exploration of the legacy of trauma, both personal um, and sort of national, because this is grappling with um, things that you know have happened all over the world but I think particularly in Irish history um, we are tackling the history of the Madeleine Laundries um, and also sort of the historic um, abuse carried out by priests in Ireland and abroad uh, and how those priests were were protected by the Catholic Church for a very long time and some would argue still to this day. Um, so there's that which obviously sort of happens nationally and affects the nation and their sense of what happened but also those things have really personally impacted on Tom's life and he is an older man and what happens throughout the book is that we're not always sure if he's remembering right and he has versions of his past that he tells himself almost like to reassure himself. And then we very jarringly find out that actually that version that he's telling himself is not the real version that happened and that, that he's re repressing something or he's lying about something or he's lying to himself. Um, 
and there's these sort of digressions that he falls down sometimes he's he'll be in one situation and he'll like think something else is happening and then you'll get jarred back to reality and realize that thing that he was imagining that was happening didn't even happen at all or he'll suddenly be reminded of something that happened a very long time ago and those digressions were really affecting but at points I thought a little too effective in that sometimes I also found my thoughts wandering and that I was I was also very confused at points which I think just means the writing was working but also like depending on my mood I don't always love to be reading something and being like what because I have a tendency to miss things or forget things anyway because shocker Hannah lost the plot doesn't have a great head for plot um sometimes I was reading it being like have I missed something or is he confused um so very very specific to me that was one of the things that stopped me kind of loving it but this this book was absolutely heartbreaking and um please check the content warning I mean I would say for any of the Booker Prize long list, check the content warnings, but especially for this one, because there are some quite um, graphic things being recounted and it's very, very difficult to read about, um, but important to read about nonetheless, if you are able to. So that was the last book I read in August and um, there we go. On reflection, it was it was a good reading. It was a good reading month. And I read a, I read a lot of books that I don't know that I would have got to otherwise. Um, so that was that was fun. But let me know. Um, let me know what your reading was like over the summer. Let me know what your best book was. Um, if you discovered anything new this month, if you are also reading the Booker Prize long list, let me know your thoughts on your favourites down below, because at the moment, I gotta say guys, I'm a little underwhelmed. I am a little underwhelmed. I have never read an entire long list before. And I don't know if it's just because I'm quite new to that experience that some of them felt quite samey. Um, but yeah, I'm... So far I haven't, I'm sub I haven't hated anything and I haven't loved anything. Um, I've just sort of felt some shade of middling about about most of them so if you've had a different experience let me know down below and if you have read the others and you think they're better so the other seven titles that I haven't listed here then like let me know because also I might just need pepping up maybe I've accidentally left the ones that I'm gonna love to the end um but yeah if you have liked this video please um literally like it in the little like the little like button, give that a press because that would really help. Uh, my videos find people um, who might be interested in them and um, if you're new here and you have enjoyed these very tired ramblings, um, consider subscribing to my channel for, for more. Um, if you want the Booker Prize long list, you, you, you better subscribe for that vlog because that will be up realistically. I would love for it to be up before the shortlist is announced. Um, but I did just pick the beasting up from the library and wow, that book is chunky. So um, we'll see, we'll see. But have a good rest of the day or night, wherever you are. And uh, I will see you for another video soon.